So when I was a kid, you would go to like a summer camp. And a lot of times at those summer camps, you would meet people that weren't necessarily lived where you lived. They'd be from different places. And they would have this tremendous impact on you. And it was just amazing to see, you know, in a short amount of time, how someone that was just introduced into your life could actually have such a positive impact on you. And then you would say like, hey, I, you know, we're going to keep in touch. You know, we're going to write letters. You know, we're going to maybe make phone calls, things like that. And then you realize, hey, the phone calls uh, long distance. So now it costs a lot of money. It's kind of hard to write letters all the time. And a lot of those people that when I was a kid had those, you know, moments where we had those positive interactions, um, you, lose, you lose touch with them because it's really hard to communicate and one of the things that I appreciate is that we live in this time where we can have our summer camp friends forever, that we have those interactions with people that we might meet at a conference at an event, um, somewhere we don't usually go. They can have that tremendous impact on you and then you can keep it forever. And this is what Dr. Keisha Campbell is for me. I met her a couple of years ago and immediately we connected because I was having a really rough day. I was having a really hard time and her energy and her connection just brought me out of it. And then I find out she's like a psychologist. She deals with uh, depression, anxiety, you know, PTSD, things like this. And I think she might've read, you know, maybe what I was feeling that day, found those things, or maybe it was just a connection. But what's really cool is that even though we met, you know, years ago at an event, We've never seen each other ever since, not in person, uh, but we've connected through Instagram, uh, through Twitter. We DM, we lift each other up, we cheer each other people, we, we cheer each other on. And it's one of the things that I really appreciate about her. And I'll tell you that when you watch this podcast or you listen to this podcast with Dr. Keisha Campbell or both, you're gonna see her energy and just you know how uplifting she is. And I'm so grateful that I can have this podcast where people might, you know, listen to some of the stuff I share, but they're introduced to wonderful guests. But I'm more appreciative that I get to reconnect with people and have these conversations. And uh, Dr. Keisha Campbell was one that I just really appreciated having. And I know you're going to enjoy it. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast. I hope you enjoy it as much as I did. Hey everyone, this is George Kroos, another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. And one of the things I love about this podcast is I have the opportunity to sit down and connect with people that um, I haven't been able to see in person maybe in a long time, you know, maybe ever. And one of the people I really want to connect with is Dr. Keisha Campbell. And the reason I want to connect with Keisha so much is, and this is a very personal story, I was actually um, in her school district and was to be honest with you i was exhausted i was having a very emotional day and honestly felt um i was on the verge of basically an emotional breakdown and i was really struggling that day and keisha is someone who i've never met in my life before and we never talked didn't know anything about each other that day and we had a moment uh w with millie vanilli playing millie yeah. vanilli and I'll yeah. tell you, she lifted me in a way that I didn't even know I needed that day. And I'm like so forever grateful for you because you have no idea the impact you had on me that day. And, and, and like here I am, I'm the guy who's supposed to be there motivating people. Like that was literally my no. job for the day, right? And you like motivated and inspired me that day. And I, I just like, I'm glad that I can just say thank you. I know it's not in person, but you know, at least I can see you. And um, yeah, you, 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 you save me more than I can ever tell you right now and probably would feel comfortable telling on a recording, but it's just so appreciative of you. And I know that you are, um, if, if you follow Keisha, I, I, I connect with her on Instagram and uh, we have this little joke that we're like uh, the Care Bear squad that we just kind of try to be positive yeah. and find, you know, and lift people up. And, and I know this, you do this by example, because you did it for me. And so Keisha, thank you so much, not only for being on the podcast, obviously, but for all that you've done for me and to connect with me. And I'm so glad that people are, um, are going to get to sit down and, and, and listen to uh, hear about your educational journey. So while you're here today, can you just uh, tell us who you are, what you're doing and how you got to that point in your career? 
Of course. But first, I got to tell my half of the story <laughs> as well. I'm very appreciative of this moment. Thank you. I'm very glad that you um, and honored that you invited me on your platform. Um, I remember that day vividly working Palmdale School District, <laughs> having our mm -hmm. training. And I remember I was talking to a coworker and I just came back from vacation in Greece. And I turned just, around. And just I wait, Millie just wait, Greece. I got to I got to do. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Greece. I got to give a shout out. <laughs> yes. And I heard Melly Vanelli in the background and I'm like, wait a second, Greece, <laughs> Melly Vanelli. And I saw you and I remember you came over and you're like, what are you guys talking about? <laughs> and I just jumped right in. I'm like, I just came back from Greece. And you're like, really? <laughs> and we just started talking and connecting. Mm -hmm. And during the whole training, I was impressed of how you commanded a room, how you showed up. And I had no idea that you were going through something yeah. at that moment. And you still turned it on and you still gave. That was so impressive. Mm -hmm. And then when I remember you, you asked me a question um, publicly and after and reflecting on that moment, just you talking to me in that, that space gave me so much confidence to use my voice. And so just like how you say that I gave you something in my kindness, you gave me something in yours too. Because mm -hmm. it was from that moment that I realized, you know what, I can't be more vocal and share myself and share my opinions and share who I am. I'm not that bad after all. I'm not that flashy. I'm not that out there. And so I really do appreciate that. And ever since then, like you said, we've been the adult care bear committee <laughs> all over That's the right. place. <laughs> right. and, and actually, so, you know, it was one of the cool things is I remember this. I met your mom that day too yes right and yes. and i'll tell you you still gotta tell us about your educational career and i so appreciate that you're i'm a very big family person um your mom you could feel was so glowing with pride with you that day yes. and it was like she didn't ne yeah. necessarily need to see anything it was just like it was just such a sweet it was just such a sweet moment when i met both of you together uh, later in that day and i remember that i remember distinctly just feeling her glowing with energy of how proud she is of you too and you know oh george uh, right she's proud today you know she was bragging about this to all Stop. her coworkers seriously <laughs> she, well, she's yes she sent a text to everyone she was like my daughter is going to be on george get out of here. You, you, I'm not even joking. You say hi to her, okay? Because okay. she's a wonderful person too, and obviously, you know, an amazing mom. So, okay, so I I so appreciate that. Um, yeah, we could just talk about you know how awesome. No, I'm just kidding. So the yeah, but, but uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about who you are, because I, I think especially right now, uh, people like we're recording this going into summer, uh, going into yeah. a new school year. I think you know your message is more important than ever. So tell us a little bit about oh, your career, you. and thank you so much for sharing that. That really means a lot to me. Of course, of course. Um, thank you so much. My name is Keisha Campbell. I do have a doctorate in psychology and a master's in um, marriage and family therapy. And I work in the school district right now, Palmdale School District, leading the way mm -hmm. with social emotional learning specialists. So um, what I do is ba basically provide resources for family for mental health. Um, I do groups, anger management, confidence building groups, um, girls groups, boys groups to help them with um, regulating their emotions, groups for PTSD and anxiety and meditation. So helping to pay attention to paying attention, helping mm -hmm. our kids do that in a creative way. Um, and then also helping parents <laughs> with behaviors that they're seeing inside the home, teachers with behaviors that they're seeing in the classroom and um, just bridging that gap. Because I think right now, especially after this year, people are seeing the importance of taking care of your mental health like never before. Right. Um, especially talking to parents when they're or really concerned about their child's grades. I just had to kind of pull their ear and say, you know what, right now, um, let's work on emotional stability. Let's work on coping skills because um, we're not going to care if your kid can add next year. We're going to care if they're able right. to regulate their emotions. And if they're able to do that, then they can handle anything, you know? Yeah. So, because if they can't regulate their emotions, they're not going to be able to add anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> add what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Exactly. Can, can and that's I, what we were seeing in I, the classroom. There, so, like, when you're listing off your qualifications, I'm like a little, so I'm a little bit nervous in the sense that I'm like, 
Can I turn this into a, a little session for myself? Of course. No, <laughs> I was like, going to tell you, let me know if I start therapizing you. Because no, that I'm is like, always what my fear is. No, I'm, I'm good with it. I, 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 I got to ask you a question specifically. Um, and this okay. is like a totally uh, George specific question. And this is something oh, I always struggle with. So um, okay. when you, I know you do in the terminology, it was like uh, sound. Is it sound th- yes. therapy? Sound healing with sound healing. using crystal sound bowls. Okay, so you do that, and you do a lot with meditation. So I have tried. Okay, so t- tell me how to see. Like, tell me some advice on this. Okay, one okay. of the things I, I struggle with meditation is, yeah. and I don't know if there's like a, a point to this, is that I I like I I go to sleep with sound. I yeah. have, and I'm not like talking like you know, soothing sound. I like, we'll talk about like sports shows and whatever. Like when I, I used to, when I go to the U S and travel, I always turn on ESPN and I fall asleep to ESPN. Right. And one of the things I've always struggled with is silence. And one of the things I struggle with is, is meditation because I feel I get into my own head and it's, I feel like sometimes it's a little toxic. Do you know what I mean? I feel like it gives me anxiety sometimes. And I like, how, how do you, is that like, is there like, how do I deal with that? How, and I feel like I feel super guilty because I'm like totally taking advantage of this bit. No, you know, no, no. I'm sure I'm not perfect. the only I'm not the only person who, you know, has this question, no. right? No, not at all. And of course, for me, starting off, I was the same same exact way until I realized the correlation. Um, see, we're three part beings, right? Mind, body and spirit. And so usually when we're having difficulties focusing, it's because biologically we have um, a lot of adrenaline that keeps our mind racing. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, So also there's a comparison between people that are highly organized and structured, the sounds that best suit them are like soft jazz music, um, music that has melodies that you can follow. And for people that are on the go that uh, have schedules that are more flexible, that that are not as so highly structured, sounds that don't have uh, direct rhythms Mm -hmm. and um, melodies to follow can help them decrease some of that anxiety. With the sound bowls, what's happening, there's there's seven bowls and they are correlated to the seven energy centers in the bottom of the body. And so every time the bowl is strummed, um, it releases a frequency that you hear that kind of just moves around the internal body chemistry and gets those hormones that are not regulated or not uh, balanced due to trauma in mm-hmm. the body to start pumping and going. So what you'll find is that the longer that you're able to meditate or listen to these sound healings, naturally the the adrenaline, all of the other hormones that have built up that, that are toxic in your body will start to lower. Your blood pressure will start to lower because your body's naturally producing what it needs to produce. When we're in um, traumatic situations or, or uh, hurried situations, we're producing a lot of adrenaline mm-hmm. in our body. And, and high levels of that over time pushes us through situations that sometimes we can't think through all the way. Mm-hmm. Our body responds before our brain does. And so when you're able to kind of regulate those emotions and, and calm down, you're able to make better decisions for higher emotional payoff. But it takes practice. I was the same right. way. And now when I put on the headphones and listen to um, like binaural beats, Mm -hmm. which is beats that have conflicting sounds to help um, regulate the the hemispheres in your brain. So Mm -hmm. it helps for deeper states of meditation. Now, honestly, it feels like heaven when I hear it because it's just um, just a release. Have you seen those videos of people, the ASMR, like whispering? Yeah, it's it's sort of doing the same thing. Because we're in a society with so much energy and so much um, on the go. Right. And so when you have to calm yourself down to focus and listen, yeah, it's releasing those hormones and helping regulate your emotions. I'm going to, I'm going to put, I'm going to like start a paid podcast listening. Cause I feel like I'm yeah. getting, I'm getting some gold right now. Cause like, yeah I, actually, I mean, yeah, I love it. Seriously. And then, and I know people listening to this. So, okay. So just, I want to try to understand this a little bit deeper. So, yeah. It's not, it's not just like this sound will work for everybody. It's actually kind of identifying some of the ways that you are and kind of identifying some of those different, is that, is that my, yeah. I understand that correctly? Because that, that to yes. me, like, you know, I just, I think a lot of times it's, um, I like if I get a massage, it's like, mm-hmm. 
this music's not doing anything. It's actually making me more anxious sometimes. Right. And maybe it's yeah, kind of just how yeah. I'm wired a little bit. Is that, am I reading yeah. that right? It could be right. You got to mm. find what works for you, mm-hmm. but then also there's a number of things, right? When you set yourself down for meditation, um, sometimes people feel guilty. There's a number of thoughts that goes through their head. Like, is this really working? Do I even have time for this? So they don't even mm-hmm. gift themselves right. the time of silence mm-hmm. of just not move, not moving, um, relaxing your brain. And so when you get into those, those, that space of just letting what comes to you and observe your thoughts, right. Observe what's happening so that you can make better decisions. Um, it prepares you, it, it, it makes you able to regulate yourselves in difficult situations. And so that you're taking what you're practicing and you can apply it to real life, right? Life is supposed to be a walking meditation. If you think about it, you're supposed to always be aware of what's happening, what's happening to yourself Mm -hmm. so that when you're encountering something, you get to choose if you want to experience it or not. We don't have to experience everything that comes into our face. Right. But the problem is people get so triggered by what's in front of them right. because of a biological response mm-hmm. that's inside of them. Think about, I don't know, think about a situation that happened to you that caused some sort of trauma that, you know, you'll have a trigger to. Mm-hmm. Right. It's stored in your body. Mm-hmm. All of that, all of that energy, all of the hormones, the built up hormone levels are stored. So when you have a similar trigger that you encounter, your body will respond faster than your brain will. Unless you put yourself in different environments to get what you need naturally, right? It, case in point, this is like somebody that is suffering from depression, anxiety, and going and getting um, getting a pill to help them mm-hmm. lower their anxiety. Right. Instead of that, you're putting yourself in an environment to listen to sounds mm-hmm. that when your eardrum vibrates, that you right now, you're hearing me. Your, my, your body yeah. chemistry is changing and uplifting to we're, we're balancing each other out. We're coming to each other's frequency right now. Right. Mm-hmm. And so my voice is providing therapy for you mm-hmm. by helping to regulate those internal, that internal chemistry. And so the more that happens and the more that you expose yourself to that and when in during your walking life, you're able to make better decisions. So you have, like I you have no idea like how much I need this conversation right now like yeah. I feel I feel like I'm this is like unfair like I'm like this is so helpful no. to me like literally right it's now Phil it's Phil Jackson it's the Phil Jackson of me. yeah right <laughs> it is and so the the so something you said and uh, it's actually it's really interesting because I notice it's 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 interesting that you said this about the body thing because if I get anxiety. Or okay, yeah. so how I, how I know I'm getting anxiety is my feet become. I, this is like probably I, maybe I'm t- doing oh, no. some TMI right now. My feet become super clammy. Yes. And then when I feel that, then it like goes to my mind. Like it's like yeah. literally, it's not it's not like my head that does it. It's my it's literally my feet, and I feel yes. that. And then as soon as I feel that, then it actually affects like other parts, and then I start you know and yeah. and like I can actually like tell you. Way ahead of people. Because you've identified what the triggers. Most people, when I'm starting with like kids or adults, I'm like, what is your body trigger? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, what happens in your body? Do your hands get sweaty? Do your feet get sweaty? Do your ears start ringing? Identify what it is so you know what's happening. Right. And so when you identify, okay, your feet are sweaty, what was the external trigger? Hmm. Was it talking in front of these people? Was it this, this person say something that made you uncomfortable? Was it, you know, you, you start to identify what it is and then you apply the thought pattern. Hmm. Then you can see, okay, well, really, this really doesn't have anything to do with me. This is right. her energy, you know, right, or right, right. it does. Have, so you, you can decide what you, how do you want huh. to respond? You know? And this is, this is, I, yeah. I this Our is super helpful to me. Oh, yeah. Our body communicates to us. I tell people all the time, you know, there's nothing wrong with us. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong. Your anxiety and depression is telling you that something's wrong in the environment, not you. (laughs) It's the environment that needs to change. So, so I got, we were talking a little bit about this, um, you know, before we started recording the podcast and, Mm -hmm. um, and I I so appreciate you have been so supportive of kind of my health habits and what I was doing. And one of the, one of the things that I, 
I was shared with you before is that it wasn't like there's, there's been some really hard work in me yeah. losing weight, but it's, it's yeah. been, it's been discipline. It's been like, yeah. it's been, it's been, it's a, like a lot of people see it as like a physical accomplishment. And I see it as a mental accomplishment that helped the physical, mm-hmm. if that makes mm-hmm. sense. And one mm-hmm. of the stories I shared with you um, before we get on the podcast is I would, I would have this habit of like eating at night. Right. And I would get, you know, like some, you know, like hunger pains, right? Some stomach pains. And I got to a point where I was like, okay, my weight, I know this is a bad habit. I know I shouldn't be doing this. I know this is causing me to do this. And what I actually said one day, I'll never forget this. And uh, I haven't had a late night snack since, right? And usually like late night snacks aren't like celery. It's like, you know, yeah, bag right. of, it's, it's not like hot Cheetos. Right. right. <laughs> it's, it's like it, to me, well, it's for me, like I, you know, um, it, it wasn't, it nest, like even if I tried to start off good, it'd be like, hey, I'll have this celery and like, you know, and a bag of chips, but I had celery, right? Yeah. Um, right. And so what I said to myself that first night where I changed this habit was you're not going to starve to death. And, and yeah. the reason I said that is because in my mind, when I was getting hungry, I'm like, oh my God, if you don't eat, like something yeah. bad's going to happen. And I'm like, no, like, I'll, I'll be okay. And now like, I don't, I don't actually like it. it I had to do that a few times um, that first week. And now I don't have those struggles and I have like certain, you know, patterns. And so like when, like it was a lot with my mental uh, switch and like, you know, thinking about how I eat and then it made it easier because a lot of people and because it was like really a lot about how I ate, but how it wasn't just how I ate. It's now how I saw food and how I saw food. Like when did it actually like, and you talk about triggers, uh, you know, a trigger for me is like, I get anxiety and I, you know, need to eat something gross, right? Like a, like a, some, you know, yeah. and I, it's not like I don't ever eat unhealthy food. Right. But I like what I know yeah. you, I know you and I are big sports fans. We're both basketball fans. Yes. Um, one of the things that I changed with, my thinking was I went from uh, like uh, I could eat during watching a basketball game on TV, but I didn't eat because a game was on. Right. So if I was, if I would eat at six every day, 6 PM and there was a basketball game on, then that's when I eat and I can watch the basketball game. But what I used to do is like, Oh, there's a basketball game on and it's, you know, it's nine o'clock. So I'm going to start eating. And then it was just like, that was like, it was like, that was the trigger. Right. And I started identifying like, Hey, yeah. focus more on doing the time. And so like, is that, is that like, yeah. is that part of like, you know, kind of talking about those, like, you know, that mental connection, is that part of it? Just, I, I'm curious what you think oh, about yeah. that journey. First, first and foremost, you held yourself accountable. And that's something that a lot of people struggle doing, mm-hmm. right? Taking their own advice, holding, holding themselves accountable. You woke up one day and you were like, you know what, what am I doing? Yeah, <laughs> like this is, right. I'm not going to die. I'll Okay. Right. And with food, um, food provides a lot of comfort, especially in times of distress. Right. right? When we get stressed, that cortisol level kicks up. And so that spikes our hunger. So we want to eat. Right. And so what has happened is a lot of people have find their comfort in eating. And Mm -hmm. when you the weight gain comes is from the suppression of the voice, suppression of you speaking your truth in all aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. Right. And sometimes people eat that anxiety away or stuff it down. And so it's that suppression um, of that voice and also finding comfort in something that you cannot, something that's not going to fail you. Food is good, right? Right, You right. You find something that you like and it's always there for you. You can eat it. And so, um, that I see is, is where that correlation comes in. And so when people, I find that, are um, standing in their truth and holding themselves accountable and wanting to make changes, then I notice that that's when the weight literally slides off for some, right? Because it's not, it's not about the weight. It's about the mindset. And, and I, th- I think it's just, about, yeah, I think just listening to you, um, having that awareness, like it was like I had to kind of become yeah. aware of what I was doing before I could actually deal with it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Cause right? I, I think that's that, that mental connection that you have. And so like, I'm like, I feel like I'm like, re- yes. I'm really learning about myself during this and probably, I don't know if anyone else cares, but I, I, no, really. this is helpful to me. It's been like that for me too. It's been like that for me too. Yeah. I, during when the pandemic started, mm-hmm. right. It came at a point in my life where 
you know, the year before, I, you know, I lost my brother, you know, mm -hmm. I uh, went through a breakup. And so then it was like, okay, I have this time, I have this opportunity. Um, I don't know if I necessarily want to work in the school district forever, right? Mm -hmm. I, what what can I do? And that's when social media, you know, right. during times of boredom, getting on there and realizing, you know what, I'm not just going to be social on here. I'm going to use this platform yeah. for as much as I can, you know, um, and I'm going to give myself therapy because I'm the best therapist I know. I'm the right. best psychologist out there. I'm going to flip this lens right that's in. Right. I, and that's exactly what I did flipped it and I held myself accountable. I was truthful, right? I had to recognize what those triggers were. And so, okay, when I'm feeling like this, am I really hungry? Because same with me, I would just not eat the best, right? right. But I had to figure out, okay, what worked for me? I'm more of a grazer. I have to graze at certain times because I remember, I realized that I might need this to supply my energy in the future for what's going to happen, you know? And so getting into that routine, realizing what are emotional triggers for me and watching how I respond, rising above things, not letting things bother me so much, it, it impacted not only my mental health, mm -hmm. my spiritual health, and my physical health. I was interacting with people who I want to interact with <laughs> more, right? right? Yep. Feeling better about that because when you feel better right after this you're probably going to go and run a mile right because right. like right. think about all the dopamine and oxytocin that we're exchanging right now we're laughing we're having a good time you know i'm not going to go and like now go eat a pizza because i'm right. sad you know because yeah. i'm craving salty food yeah i, I think i you think know? when you're talking about that one of the things that's really helped me is i've really been identifying hey how do i feel when i'm around speaking to certain people and you know what? Do I need this? Do I actually, this person doesn't make me feel better. This actually, you know, makes things worse. And, and, and it's not, and, and I actually, like, I, I think a lot of times when people say that, they think like, oh, that, like, I, it's me saying that person is bad. That person's evil. But it's not. It's that, it's that person's is maybe bad for me. And it may be the connection that we have with one another. Right. And they could be the, yeah. one of the most uplifting people to others, but our connection just, yeah. it just, there's something that, you know, happens there. So I've just been really more mindful of that. Um, I got to ask you this because, yeah. um, I know you, you, you have had a really positive, um, relationship. Well, I shouldn't, I don't know if a positive relationship is the way to see it. Like the, the you have a positive lens and viewpoint, on how you utilize social media and how you've like use it to like share your voice, how you utilize it to like lift yeah. other people up. But one of the things that I know you yeah. probably deal with is students in the classroom who have a negative, um, you know, connection to social media and it maybe makes them feel worse. It maybe actually, you know, um, I don't know, maybe, you know, hurts their psyche, their, the, you know, their social emotional well being. And I'm, I'm very cognizant of, of like, who I connect with on social media, what I'm sharing. Um, I, I know this is a, and I know you know how much I love my kids. I almost see my social yeah. media account as a diary to my children. Like I want my kids to be able to look back and Absolutely. see how I interacted with people and how, like, what did I share? What did I utilize and things like that too. So like, how, how do you navigate? Cause I know a lot of people that listen to this. Um, Cause I, I, like, it's, yeah. it's not it, like you, you, are, you are living proof of this. You can use this and actually have like a positive emotional mental connection. But I think people just say like social media yeah. kids evil, right? Like not should never go together. But like, so how do yeah, you, how do yeah. you work with students in that, in that space? Well, I make the positive so loud that the negatives become impossible to heal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> First and foremost. Yeah, you all, right. all right. I'll take it. Drop it off. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take it. Um, but you know what? I think that our generation was blessed to not have that boom of social media right, right when it was, because it allowed us to find other coping skills to, um, you know, utilize, such as going outside <laughs> and, right. you know, building social connections face to face. So, it gave me a unique lens of what we're not getting right now and what needs to be enhanced. So when I talk to parents, I'm, I'm real with them. And I think that they appreciate that. Yeah. I let them know, listen, the cell phone that you're giving your 11 year old, 12 year old, 13 year old is a computer. And if you're not going to regulate it, their right. friends are going to teach them how to use it. Right. Um, and then I also let them know about, you know, how, 
raising a child with no boundaries on right. social media platforms, what can happen? A lot of the fights and the disagreements that were on the school campus came because of social media. Right. It just came over. Monday morning, the fights were because this one posted or subtweeted or things that I didn't even know the right. lingo for about that. So I would call the parents in and said, look, this is what's happening. This is who your daughter is representing themselves to be or your son to be online. And this is what they're saying. And so I was really big on holding parents and students accountable on campus mm -hmm. and even off campus. Mm -hmm. um, so just making parents aware of what their kids are exposed to. Sometimes that was like, what? They're not just calling me? No, they're not just calling you. <laughs> right. They're not just calling you. They're actually looking at inappropriate things and cursing people out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So having parents aware of what's actually happening and not sugarcoating things, um, was really helpful and also letting parents know don't sugarcoat your conversations with your kids stop using baby language right. <laughs> be really real when you're explaining things to them um and build upon concepts don't wait until 13 to have the sex talk right. you know start telling them about body parts and the functionings before that so that when you have that talk with them they're not already trying to experiment unfortunately that's right. what's happening so um just having parents realize what's happening developmentally at each step of the way and different influences and how those influences can impact their behavior has been really helpful and parents have really appreciated that because they don't they don't know right. you know uh, there's no real hardcore book on how to do thing you know and what? it's just all from my observation of what i'm seeing and and like i really so one of the things i appreciate about you know your perspective on this is that like really a proactive approach right and I like it, one of the things yeah. I find really fascinating about social media is that usually the terms of service of like when a, when a person is able to sign up, like the age level is um, 13 years old. Right. Mm. And then I think, when was I the worst human being ever? Oh, it was 13 years old. Like it's literally the exact same time. Exactly. And, it, and it's like, yeah, like, you know, you're, yeah. you're dealing with a lot of stuff exactly. at that age and like, you're, you're trying to find your way. You're having this like backlash a lot of times for me right. anyway, with to my parents, like, you know, my friend's voice is more important. And I think, you know, we like just kind of committing to this idea, like, Hey, like we want to kind of model us. Like, I don't know if you saw this, but Clea and I did, you'll actually super appreciate this. Uh, Clea and I did like a, a unboxing of Kobe, uh, Kobe, uh, basketball shoes. Cause she wants to be a YouTuber. Uh, I love basketball. I love basketball yeah. shoes. I'm obsessed. Yeah. And so it's like, Hey, like, let's kind of do this together. Let's kind of like go through this yeah, and yeah. kind of modeling this too. Right. And I, and I don't, I, and I don't like baby talk her. I just like, we do it. And she, you know, she says yeah. what she says and, and I want to be active in, in that space. Right. And I feel like I understand that I'm yeah. okay with her making mistakes younger with me rather than making mistakes when she's older without me. Uh, you know, on like, and I'm not talking like tw in her twenties, I'm talking like 13, 14 years old. So I think that proactive approach that you have, yeah. like parents being actively involved, because I think a lot of times, like, I think some of the mess that we've got yeah. in with social media was, uh, you know, schools were saying, this is not our problem. Parents were saying, I don't know what to do. And then we were playing like Lord of yeah. the Flies. I don't know if you know that book, Lord of the Flies. Let's throw kids on an island yeah. and let's just hope for the best, right? And then, you know, obviously Piggy for dies. Real. And so like it's, I, that approach is, is yeah. really important. Um, when, when, uh, when people are listening to this, uh, they're, they're about to, to begin or maybe depending on where they are, uh, you know, in the world, they are starting the school year, right? And so I feel, and, and, I, and I don't know if you agree with this assessment, but I feel that, you know, everyone has some level of trauma uh, from this past yeah. year, just from dealing with, you know, we have yeah. different, yeah. and yeah. Even, even if we had like, uh, you know, we welcome Georgia to the world, right? Like our, our, our second daughter. And like, that was like a big deal. Yeah. And so like, yeah, it's, it's something I'm excited about, but it doesn't mean that everything was just awesome, right? So like, as, uh, you know, schools... And, you know, families are, you know, bringing kids back um, and they're, you know, they're kind of trying to get, I don't, I don't want to say get, get back to normal because I know a lot of people are doing things very differently in a positive way too. Like, what would you, what advice would you give to educators and like how to work with students, you know, coming into this school year? Yeah. 
I would say, you know, don't go, don't go in like hardcore. Don't right. try to or take your hat off and you know do all that. Um, regulate them on the on the dress code just right there. I think building the connection and and we speak you speak about this all the time. It's so important because when you have kids on your side because you've invested in them, right. you've built a connection with them, you care about them, you you're interested in what they did for the weekend. You know you're interested about their social groups. It's easier to have an influence on them. It's easier for them to be interested in wanting to show up and perform for their for their best self and for teachers. You know, mm -hmm. we spoke about teachers that were inspiring and administrators. I mean, my fifth grade teacher, Miss Whitaker, the only reason why I went to summer camp was because I wanted to impress her. <laughs> you right. know what I mean? Because right. she was so great and awesome. I wanted to get good grades to, you know, impress her and let her know that her hard work paid off as well. So I think teachers and administrators just focusing on building that relationship. And um, I think that they'll see the importance of that now, especially coming back. Um, and now we see how important relationships are because mm -hmm. that's what has gotten a lot of people through this year. It wasn't just, you know, anything else. It was like everything was taken away. And now you realize, oh, wow, you know, this family was impacted by COVID. Mm -hmm. How easy it is to lose someone, you know? And so now let me appreciate these moments a little bit more. So helping kids um, regulate their emotions, come to terms with what happened share you know there's nothing wrong with as a teacher and mm -hmm. administrator share how you know it was scary for you to normalize mm -hmm. things you know um I, you know i was raised during a time where you know and before me kids were seen and not heard you know and we see th the damaging impact of that of silencing your voice and mm -hmm. and um suppressing your emotions but now when you speak about things and in a healthy way and in a respectful way, um, it lets you know that you're not alone and that, you know, we're all connected and we're, we're here to support one another. And so when that happens, learning is easier, right? You want to learn because you're in a safe space. And, and okay. one, one of the things you said, I think really connected with me was, you know, we appreciated some things that maybe we neglected earlier. Right. And we didn't, we didn't appreciate in the same way. And I remember talking to, um, a, a group of students in, it was, I can't remember. It was maybe in, at the end of 2020. And, and I remember them saying to me, yeah, like when we were told, like we, like school is going to be canceled for the next two weeks for COVID. We were so excited. Like we were so pumped about right. this. And then three days in, we're like, oh, this sucks. Like I miss my friends. I miss you know, being in school. <laughs> right. And I, yeah, it's not, it's not exclusive. Yeah. Like probably a lot of adults felt the same way too. Right. And I think, you know, that appreciation, oh, yeah. um, you know, for, you know, what we have and, and hopefully we all have, we, 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 we don't take that for granted. And, you know, it's something, you know, like, and I said, yeah. I, I think I try my best to not take those moments for granted, which is why we've stayed connected for so long. And I'm, I'm going to ask yeah, you, this absolutely. is the last, this is the last thing I'm going to ask you. And uh, this has nothing to do with okay. education at all, but you are a Lakers fan. Okay. okay? You and I are both Lakers yeah, fans, right? Through and through. So when, yeah. when did you, when, okay. When did you start liking Lakers? When, like, when was that? Oh, it was my player. My, okay, so I was born in New York, yeah. right? And my parents, <laughs> at two years old, yeah. wanted to a chain of scenery and get away. My mom was obsessed with the Showtime Lakers, okay? Yes. Magic Johnson, yes. Prima Jules all of them. They literally mapped out from New York <laughs> to Inglewood, California. I love it. I'm not even joking. Did you, did you live in Inglewood? Trip. Did you live in Inglewood? We lived behind the Great Western Forum. Really? Okay. So it's in my DNA. So oh, when you wow. ask me, Lakers, how long have I been a Lakers fan? Oh, a hundred years. <laughs> hey, that's amazing. Yeah. My mom, you know, yeah. So okay. it was from then. So, okay. So then who's, who's your, okay. So I'm guessing there's two players that are, that are your favorite. It's either Magic or Kobe. Is it, is it, am I correct? Is it one of those All two right. or, is it, or is it another? Who is it? Who is your favorite and your Laker player ever? Okay, okay. All right. Are you ready for this? Yeah. It's, of course, Kobe. Duh. Right. Duh. Nick Van Exel. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I loved him. I 
loved yeah. Nick Van Exel. Okay, you could not tell me anything. People would be like, "What?" I'm like, mm-hmm. "All right, great, more Nick for me." Okay, because I I loved him too. You couldn't tell me smooth knew what he was doing yeah. on the court. You know, and I had a baby crush on him. So yeah, I loved yeah. him. Kobe and Nick Van Exel. He played with uh, oh, Nick- Eddie Jones. Up there. Eddie Jones, he played with, they played with Sedell 3. Remember, like, and Cedric Sabalas was good, like, during the Nick Van yeah. was, like, hilarious. Listen, yes, okay. Okay, so. Bestie, that's okay. why. So, okay, what's, what's your, okay, okay what's your, I, I know I could talk to you forever. Okay, but what's your, like, what's your Kobe story? Like, what's your favorite Kobe story? Oh, okay. All right, are you ready for this? Yeah, okay. I am. So, 17 years old. I, uh, my parents don't know what to get me for Christmas, right? Like just, I'm like one of those kids. I open up a shoe box and in there are Lakers tickets. Oh, okay? yeah. I lose my mind, right? So we go to the game. Of course, my, my dad takes me three hours early. This is when you could go and see the shoot around. Yeah. This was Kobe's rookie season. Yeah. All right, rookie. And so I'm down there on the court watching eyes open nick van exel <laughs> okay, of course right shoot around and then i look over to the hall and here comes kobe and he just starts shooting and i'm just watching him like yeah. mind you he's a rookie and he's yeah. he's warming up like he's shack like he's warming up like he's gonna right. play he didn't even play that game really okay and yeah, he was like 18 and I, he was 18 years old then yeah too, right? yeah yeah, this is Bill Harris was the coach. Remember, we had to like yell for like Kobe to get in the last two minutes of the right. fourth quarter. Right. And so I remember just watching him, and and this was right before they had to go back in um, to the hall, and I just yelled out, "I'm like, hey, Kobe!" And he went up for the shot, and he gave me like a little wink. Oh, uh, I melted. <laughs> that that was uh, it. Yeah, he's, that was it. <laughs> he, he, he's uh, him and Magic. Yeah. I, I like he, he, if you ask me on any day, I can't tell you which one's my favorite. But like, I kind of think Kobe. Um, yeah. but the, I, I, so yeah. it's, it's funny the same year the, you'll, you're going to appreciate this. So yeah. like how, so I don't, I live in Canada, right. And basketball is not big there <laughs> here at the time. It's huge now. Cause the Raptors won, uh, pretty pumped about that. Yeah. And, uh, and, yes. uh, I was like obsessed with the Lakers and there is a gentleman who played basketball yeah. in Saskatoon. You'll, you're going to love this story. Cause it's like, like, you know, I, I watched Zion Williamson yeah. play since he's like 12 years old. Because of social media, you see like the crazy dunks, but like I didn't yeah. know anything about Kobe. So Willie Murda played basketball with a semi pro. He was he would come play with us. He was so ridiculously good. I was he's just like the best basketball yeah. player I've ever played with. And you probably never have heard of this guy. So he got a trial with the Lakers. Uh, this guy from that is living in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Canada. He got a trial with the Lakers <laughs> the year that uh, Shaq uh, signed with the Lakers. And he came back to, okay, yeah. He, yeah, he came back to, um, he got cut. He was the very last cut of that team of the, that the first year Shaq was there. Wow. And so he came back, he's wearing all this Lakers yeah. practice gear, playing in a gym with me. This is the coolest thing. He like, he was like me playing with grade, grade two kids, right? Like he was just, he would just toy with us. Right. Yes. <laughs> and so I said to him, I'll never forget this. I said, how is Shaq? Like, how is Shaq? And he goes, he goes, Shaq was really good, but there's this kid named Kobe Bryant who's just amazing, and he's going to be, like, a superstar. I'm like, who? He's like, Kobe Bryant. I'm like, what are you talking about, Kobe Bryant? <laughs> yeah, like, I'll never, I'll never forget that. And I was like, okay, whatever. I don't care about some kid named Kobe Bryant. Tell me about Shaq. He's like, I'm telling you, Kobe yeah. Bryant. And that was, that was literally my first introduction was – I knew a guy who tried out with Kobe Bryant, who's trying to convince me Kobe Bryant's going to be a good player. I've never heard of this guy. And then he ends up becoming like my favorite player ever. And I just, I'll never forget that. So that, that was wow. literally my first introduction. I've never saw him play. I never saw a video, nothing. I, Willie Murdoch play, tried out with him and I'll, I'll never forget that. It was just such a cool thing. Yeah. And he, and like, I was like, if, you, that. if, if that guy got cut, I can't imagine how good these players are. He was just incredible. Right. right? And, and, yeah. So anyway, yeah, you know, I don't know if I ever told you this like Sean Kemp. I tried out for the Sparks too. Like really. Like I just really? like took all my confidence in the back. Yes. Like I but like for the LA like, you know for that you tried for the LA Sparks? For the LA Sparks. I love that. It I didn't know dream. that. I Yeah. 
Yeah, it was my dream. I played basketball in high school. I played on the varsity. I, yeah, I went to a private school, but I played on the varsity team, high school bar varsity team in eighth grade. Yeah. Like I was die hard. Like if my parents like groomed me that way, oh, I would be in the league. Like seriously, I love it. I, like I, I love it. for real. And I remember I just Sean Kemp it one year. And I was like, you know what? I'm gonna try out. I love it. Okay, I lasted the first round. The second round. <laughs> I was like throwing up in the corner. I was like, oh, these girls are serious. <laughs> they wanted way too much. <laughs> I had no I didn't even play myself. I, I had just... no idea about this. We, yeah. This would have been a totally different podcast oh, if, yeah. I would have known, if I would have known this. We would just talked about that. That's amazing. That's like, who, who was on? Who, Listen, was, I always use that one for. Was it, was it like Lisa Leslie on the team at that time? Like, Go who, ahead. Who, who was on the team of, on the spot? Yeah, it was everybody. Lisa was Leslie, on. right? Lisa Leslie was on the team. I don't know if Candace Parker was on the team that year. I'm not sure, but it was, a, I, I remember um, Michael Cooper. He was in the, in the gym too. And I was like, oh my gosh, my eye was Cooper. Olympia Scott That's from, yeah, Olympia Scott from who played for Stanford at the time when I got out of my car, like we parked cars the same area and so we were both were looking and she was just so nice and i remember watching her on tv with tara tara vanderbilt like literally i'm like oh my god what am i doing here this is amazing and then i go in but after a while i'm like i'm about to throw up i can't i can't do this but i did it i, I showed it. up i love it you know i had no clue yeah. about this and i it just just makes you you're just more of a legend than when you first started with me it's just amazing so i love it <laughs> Oh, thank you. Anyways, I I know yeah. uh, we have a we have a cut off time here, so I just want to take the moment to just say you yeah. you continuously lift me up every time I interact with you, even even sometimes oh. and I need to be better about this. Even sometimes I see your stuff on social media, and you just make my day better. Yeah. And I should tell you that, and I. I, I apologize that I don't oh, do that more, you. but you do that for so many people. And so um, anyone who's listening right now uh, to connect with Dr. Keisha Campbell, just look in the description. You're going to see her Instagram and where you can actually uh, find her. But seriously, thank you so much for being here. Say hi to your mom. Thank Say you. hi to, you know, everybody in your school district for me. Sure will. But yeah, like I, yeah. I, you, I, you've, you've literally been a blessing to me since the literally within three hey. seconds into blame it on the rain, right? Like right away. Yes, for real. Right at that first drop. That's it. All right. Well, Thank thanks, you. thanks everyone for listening. I hope you all have a wonderful day.